Listen, uh, me, you know, I'm pretty busy. I got Warhammer minis to paint. Yeah, so I don't have time to take an hour out of my day, sit down and just read a book. But you know what I can do? I can listen to some fantastic audiobooks done by our sponsor today, Audible. I would be shocked if you don't know what Audible is, but to remind you just in case, Audible is the wonderful place where you can get fantastic, high quality, excellently narrated, nar 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 narrated, poof audiobooks i genuinely listen to audible like every day whether it's a book club or it's ridiculous or whether it's because i have some kind of passion or some intrigue and a book i haven't read or i want to revisit a childhood book there's always a reason for me to do it like i'm driving somewhere i'm painting something there's always a time to have it just there and for some recommendations for all of you if you are a warhammer fan and you like necrons read twice dead king ruin it is the best necron book made it is better than infinite divine i know it is so goddamn good if you're looking for more of an audio drama there's actually a horror story i just got a chance to listen to called watcher in the rain it's really good it's an audio horror story with some warp storm stuff it's mm, it's good as for some childhood stuff you ever read christine by Stephen King about the killer car. Really, it's a really good one. It's kind of a classic. The movie's a little iffy for me, but they even did a spin-off episode of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, where Billy had like a demonic tricycle. Audible has these all available for you down there in the description. Go ahead and go to audible.com slash Bricky or text Bricky to 500-500. And they have a deal going on that you can see on screen right now. So get started, get listening. Thank you for sponsoring me. And now we're at the third installment of Uncharted. Hello, everybody. My name is Bricky, currently serving three life sentences for existing in the Netherlands. This video will be covering the third Uncharted game. I have videos on Uncharted 1 and 2. Both of them are linked in the description. Both of them are up in the cards. I would highly recommend looking at them first because I'll be referencing them very much in this video. Uncharted 3 has generally been regarded as a bit lacking. Most of the discussion around Uncharted are with 2 and 4, which are widely considered to be the game's best entries, with a lot of people also forgetting how poor Uncharted 1 really is. So Uncharted 3 kind of just gets swept alongside a bit. The first game can have a little bit of the, well, it was the times excuse for it, but releasing in 2011, Uncharted 3 doesn't really have that similar excuse. So it tends to be assumed as just a little bit lacking after completing it the poor rap it gets i don't think is actually that justified now it has problems and i'm gonna rant about those problems in this video but i remembered it as being worse than it actually was my enjoyment of the games would still go four two three one but that distance between three and one is astronomical uncharted three is not that bad despite the fact that the opening takes place in london you're bloody welcome your majesty this is the the polar opposite start to Uncharted 2, where he's hanging half dead with a train derailed over a cliff. Now, Nate and Sully are looking dapper. They're walking the London streets and they're about to make a deal. So one pat down and snarky comment later. Enjoying yourself, pal? Oh yeah, you're a comedian. In the pub, we meet Talbot. <laughs> I want you to remember that name. I want you to remember that face, Talbot. He has for us an entire briefcase full of dosh in exchange for that ring that Nathan Drake has been carrying around on his neck the last three games, two games, whatever. Sir Francis Drake's ring. A verification from Talbot ensures it's real, but the money is false. That's some fake bullshit right there. So this prompts an average Friday night in a London pub and haymakers thrown everywhere. This is the melee combat tutorial of the game. Suffice it to say, Uncharted 3 wanted to have a bigger emphasis on melee combat. In the prior games, it was generally mash square, mash square, mash square, mash square until the guy died and then you took his gun or whatever. Now it's mash square until they grab you, then mash circle, then mash square, then they might try to kick you and you press triangle, then you mash square again, then maybe another triangle, a little bit more square and you're done. You can also throw guys into each other using the circle, but that's about the end of the melee combat. That is the depth of the melee combat design. It is mashing square with a few button prompts. And honestly, it's not utilized too often. 
and that's a good thing because it kind of sucks. The entire opening bit is a fun little romp, right? You see Nathan slowly beat up a whole bunch of dudes in a London pub and even get a little bit of friendly fire. Towards more! From a gameplay perspective, it is dull. It is the same mash, mash, triangle, mash, mash, circle, mash, mash. This also introduces you to the big guy enemies, these seven foot tall brutes that you also have to fist fight. And this part is, is really not good. The melee combat in its own right is not that strong, but fighting these big guys is the same animation every single time a grab that you mash out of him doing the stupid kick that you press triangle for or just nate throwing hooks left right left right when this guy is on his knees just taking it, it is the same animation throughout the entire game whenever you fight one of these big guy enemies and it, every time it is so dull at least the dialogue still stands out okay in there you hurt just my pride. They head out of the bar, get headbutted by the comedian hater, and then you are introduced to our main villain, Marlo. She has a bit of a, ooh, look how superior I am to you. <laughs> you got a villainous way about her, but she's not as really violent as the other two. She's certainly no Lazarevich, and she's not guy from first game I, I, i'm forgetting his name i made a video on this like weeks ago but with her fancy get up and the umbrella and her little knife things a lot of showboating and stuff all she does is take the ring and that's it and our characters they live happily ever after oh no oh shut, shut up, up. After this, you get a bit of a flashback segment to Nathan Drake as a kid. He's looking for this weird, like, golden decoder device that's supposed to be mixed with the ring of Sir Francis Drake. This is the climbing tutorial, the climbing section of the game. And it's also a little bit of the cover system as you're kind of tailing Sully around the city. Young Sully, obviously. Well, old, you know, man's a fox. I'm going to blow through this part rather quickly because I think it's pretty weak. It's just a whole bunch of climbing stuff and it looks good, sure. And it also actually starts a great trend with this game when it comes to the climbing most to all climbable things in uncharted 3 are yellow in some way they have some kind of yellow hue somehow and that actually makes it really good it's much easier to find out what you're supposed to climb on i don't just jump to my death as often i do in uncharted 2 it's nice and concise without feeling a little too preachy to the player it blends in with the environment really well despite it being yellow it it's good but i mean you're tailing sully has a video game ever done tailing a target actually really well where it's exciting and enjoyable where you're staying stealth away from a person and watching them walk around and do things i i can't think of one and nathan's dialogue is the most generic bullshit. it is so dull uh, now where did he go where is he going now what's he doing i gotta get that wallet i gotta find a way to get that wallet it's right there in his pocket now's my chance but weirdly enough the moment you get into cutscenes with nathan Young Nathan, he acts like Nathan. Fine. Maybe we'll just call the police. Go ahead. Of course, they might wonder why a middle-aged tourist is following young boys down alleyways. <laughs> You are a crafty little beggar, aren't you? A failed attempt to get the decoder later, and Marlo and Sully just kind of show up. I guess they're working together, younger variants, of course, and just new partners. Marlo gives the kid a good... <laughs> and then he runs away. This chase sequence is kind of fun. All the job is just to run in a very specific direction. It's not very challenging anyway, but it's kind of looks cool as you're running away from all these different kinds of agents. And it isn't until they start shooting at you that Sully kind of gets involved in things. Oh my God, they're shooting at this kid. All right, all right, I gotta I got put a stop to this. Then, then you meet like one of the weirdest henchmen in these games. Are you all right? What are you shaking for? Just close your eyes. This won't hurt a bit. Right! Sully saves and the two of them escape and then they kind of form this little partnership kind of thing. Sully and Nathan, obviously Marlo's pissed, but he doesn't care. He's like, ah, I'm done with that job, whatever. The thing is, is that Nathan has the ring, but Marlo has the decoder. Why did it take 15 to 20 years for this to be brought back up again? I don't, I don't really know why. It's kind of strange, but uh, nap, nap was. We get some reused comedic timing, just like in Uncharted 2. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I see great things in our future, kid. Great things. 
fake well the punching wasn't the, the hitting was very 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 real but it was all ploy this gentleman right here is charlie cutter my beloved he was in on the whole thing and as you'll notice from the footage prior the occasional times he accidentally hits his own buddies were very obviously intentional and in reality the money was very much real but nathan was planning on swapping our fake ring for the real one during the scuffle and so now they can take the real ring and follow Talbot and Marlo back to their hideout, get the decoder, and continue working on whatever Sir Francis Drake was going with. And guess who we brought along? Our good friend, Chloe. This part of the game is the best part of Uncharted 3 for me. Act one, at least in terms of characters and story, it is the best part of Uncharted 3. And a lot of it is thanks to Charlie Cutter, my beloved. Charlie is just He's such a fantastic addition to this game. He keeps up with Nate all the time, and he seems like genuinely interested in finding this treasure just like Nate. He seems like intelligently, surprisingly on his level as well, which is rare because Nathan is like the guy for this. He has very similar snarky dialogue. He's a constant wise ass. He also does that thing that I notice a lot of British people do where they interrupt you a whole lot with a little bits of input, like not actually trying to interrupt you, but constantly just like filling in little little spaces with their comments. It's just, it's really good. God, do you know what this is? It's a book, mate. There's a lot of them in here. It's a library. It's not just any book, wise ass. It belonged to T.E. Lawrence. You know, Lawrence of Arabia. Yes, 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 I know, yes. Which is even crazier because he's played by the same gentleman who played Lazarevich in the second game. You look at their faces, you can kind of see the similarity, but wow, what a role change. They even do some interesting things with this character, like setting up a major fear he has. He's very claustrophobic and they show it very early on. Can we hurry it along, please, mate? All right, back there? Yeah, yeah, you know, just, just not keen on the old tight spaces, that's all. Every time he's on screen, we're back to uncharted two levels of enjoyable. So the gang follows Marlo. You do a little puzzle involving like tires and headlights, which I think was kind of fun. You start a little bit of stealth combat. This is mainly the stealth tutorial section of the game. And you eventually find this massive underground hidden lair full of stuff back from Drake's time. Marlo and Tyler realize the ring is fake. You kill some dudes. You get a cool map that Drake was hiding and you kill a whole shitload of dudes on the way out of the underground tunnel. Remember the Nate should be dead thing i mentioned in uncharted 2 they look at the look at the scene they should be fucking dead there's a lot fewer in this game luckily i actually think they've toned down that a, a tad but but this one boy go, go. bro they're right there they're in fisting range. Holy shit, I could catch a whiff of their dick. You get back to your little hideout and here starts the best dialogue in the game. Everyone is just firing at all cylinders here. Nate and Sully are still great together, don't get me wrong, but Chloe and Charlie Cutter, my beloved, like they just add so much to the scene. See this, Mark? This is John D's signature. Who the hell's John D? John D? One of Queen Elizabeth's closest advisors. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah, he was a great mathematician and navigator. Hey, way ahead of his time, he's probably the one who invented that. Seriously into the occult. I mean, like a really creepy dog. Yeah, see, way. he signed all his letters to the queen with this symbol, meaning he was her eyes. The original 007, you see, look, 007. Not really that relevant. So it was John Dee who sent Drake to Arabia. Yeah, it looks that way. Dee and Elizabeth. And Walsingham. <sighs> Great, but what for? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And this is where T.E. Lawrence comes in. See, before Lawrence became Lawrence of Arabia, great film. Look, I know I'm playing a lot of clips right now, but it's because the game is so front loaded with the character interactions. All of the best dialogue, all of the best character moments, all of that is happening right here in the first act. And I want to get that across to you because so much of it is excellent writing. The characters feel so much more human than they did in the other two games. And the other two games, well, at least in the second one, they felt pretty human. It, it increases every single game and it does it again with four. Just small things like the Sully fist bump. It's like Sabian script. script. Right. Look, the Crusaders. Chloe's little hand raise. One in Syria, the other in France. No, you two are going to Syria. 
We're heading to France. It's so authentic and it just keeps getting more authentic. I think this is a solid reason why the Uncharted games have been so darn popular. These are people that do insane things, ridiculous stunts, life-threatening injuries, things they should, they should not be alive. None of them should be alive to be perfectly honest, but they're treated just straight. They're treated like people. A whole group of people doing things that no one on earth could survive and yet they still feel like people. This is where our overall quest arrives. El Dorado, Shambhala. Now we have the Atlantis of the Sands, also known as Ubar, Iram of the Pillars, or the City of Brass. A mystical city in the middle of the Rubal Kali Desert, 400 miles long. And we need a medallion from France and Syria in order to find the location in this giant desert. So Nathan and Sully go to France, Charlie and Chloe go to Syria, and once again for the third game, we have Charlie and Nathan in a jungle area, but it doesn't last very long. The dialogue is once again really good. He has a great comment on a car during it. Look, Sully, your first car. Oh, man. That's a 1927 Auburn. I kind of wanted to ask him more about that car and learn more about that car story, but I couldn't. I think this is actually a thing that was added in The Last of Us because often someone like Ellie will say something and there'll be a little triangle prompt above her head to ask more about it. And there's a really good feature to, that was added to that game. Nate and Sully find this destroyed like Victorian style manor. They make their way through it and you have your first ever puzzle in the game. Puzzles in Uncharted 3 are the best so far of the three main trilogy. The first game was do what the journal says. The second game was do what the journal journal says, but with some climbing stuff and make it look just so much prettier. And the third game is do what the journal says, kind of, but instead the puzzle comes from more... What's the word? It's like, it doesn't require you to actually solve a puzzle or a riddle, but it's more of a, of a mechanical thing. I don't know if mathematical is the term, but it's mechanics that are part of the puzzle. Like the first puzzle has a whole bunch of knight statues and they're facing certain other objects that other knights are holding. So you have to adjust all the different kinds of knights so that they're facing the right knight and that's what opens the you know door. However, your puzzle time is short lived because guess who's here? Despite not having the information about France or Syria, not knowing where to go, Talbot and Marlow I found you because they uh, followed you. Specifically you, Nathan Drake, were followed by Talbot. Interesting. This is the point where you get a little bit more combat and oh, wow, they call me Dean Kamen, creator of the Segway. Speaking of combat, let's talk about Uncharted 3's combat. I played Uncharted 3 on hard, just like I did Uncharted 2. And I had a lot to say about the combat encounters of Uncharted 2. Now, Uncharted 3 might be just an easier game in general. That's certainly possible, but I died a fraction of the amount in Uncharted 3 than I did in the second game. Could it be easier? Sure but it just mainly felt like less bullshit. Like sure, I could still be lasered easily and die very fast, especially from a long distance. The time to kill seemed the same, the health regen seemed the same, but there were just certain little attributes here and there that just made it feel a bit better. And there weren't certain sections that were just ridiculous to deal with, like the monastery or the guardians in Uncharted 2. The first thing I noticed was that the gun sounds are a lot louder, like they're a lot louder. <laughs> Doesn't really have anything to do with the gameplay, but holy shit. They also added a little mechanic that when a grenade is thrown your way, there's a little skill check line next to it. And if you press triangle when it hits the white part of it, you'll actually throw the grenade back. This is really nice and definitely contributes to the feeling easier part because while there is still a skill part of that, you need to make sure you throw the grenade at the right time, like there's still a timing part of it. At least it doesn't make you force out of cover every single time a grenade comes your way, like in Uncharted 2, in which you were then laser to death immediately after leaving. There are also a few neat things to go along with the upgraded melee system. Like one time I pulled a guy's pin on his grenade and kicked him away. Another time I was out of ammo for my primary weapon. So I oh, killed a guy yeah. and then I grabbed his weapon out of midair. This little slow-mo badass thing. That was kind of fun. But overall, I think it's just certain tweaks to Uncharted 3's 
combat arenas that really make the big difference. Enemies don't spawn out of random areas all the time. Very often they're funneled out of certain spots that are made very clear to the player. So you're not getting flanked. You have good cover and you're able to deal with enemies in a proper way. It could be that the third game is easier. It could be I'm just better at it because I'm used to Uncharted 2. But regardless, the combat part of Uncharted 3 felt a lot better and I had a way better time playing it than I did Uncharted 2. Especially some of the level designs. We've already had underground london hidden tunnel and now we have destroyed victorian mansion and speaking of improved things let's hop back to the puzzles there are actually two more in this section one of them is a line of symbols that nathan has to walk over the exact amount of symbols in a certain way in order to get to the other side of a room and activate a door this is probably the best one when i describe like a mechanical puzzle as opposed to a puzzle puzzle because it's very obvious what you got to do you walk on that many tiles before you go to the next tile and you keep going and going and going so you just need to find the correct pathway on the tiles in order to make your way there it's more just critical thinking like mechanically than it is figuring out a mystery. And I think that's actually a pretty good way to go about it. A long time ago, I played Danganronpa, which was a surprisingly good, considering I don't like anime very much. Monkey to Luffy. But one of my biggest gripes with the gameplay is often I would come to a different conclusion on how something happened than the game would. And it's not that my answer was wrong, it's that the game's answer was more right, so to speak. It led to some aggravating moments, and I think they avoided that pretty well in Uncharted by making the solution more mechanical than actually some kind of like big brain thinky moment. And the final is a picture matching puzzle where you go ahead and move different symbols around a big board that you can see what other symbols are adjacent to it using your torch in various spots of the room. Some are grayed out and some have the other kinds of hints. So you can kind of put the pieces together on your own way. So far, all the puzzles are better, way better. But unfortunately, someone's here to ruin the mood. He takes the medallion from you, and just as he does so, the room fills with enormous American, average-sized Australian spiders, in which he happens to be the one carrying the torch, and he happens to just not seem like he gives a shit, gets the medallion as one of his comrades just dies, and bails. God, what a dick. So now comes running away at Mach 5 from a whole bunch of fucking spiders. And I'm not a big fan of big creepy crawlies. There were those like blood flies in Dishonored 2 that really gave me the heebie-jeebies. And this is like full stop the jeebie and the heebie. Though after this, you get some really good spectacle combat. Talbot's men are burning the entire place down. And I mean, I would do the same after seeing all those spires, but the way the place is breaking down, the way you're holding on for dear life as this whole mansion just comes crumbling down in flames. The combat during it, like it's visually really impressive. And it's something that Uncharted 3 does a lot more of, combining spectacle and combat. Very often in Uncharted 2, the spectacle wasn't really blended with combat. It was spectacle and combat. In the third game, you get a nice little mesh of both where you have moments of combat encounters during a big spectacle section. After you escape, we get a kind of out of the blue conversation sully seems to be having doubts on what's going on here and you know understandably so he's an older guy they just burned this place down and had giant spiders like i would be a little bit worried too but nate's response is just really out of left field remind me again why we're doing this no 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 if you're gearing up for one of your i'm too old for this speeches spare me nate these guys are playing for keeps yeah so what, you're just gonna roll over for them now? Nobody's talking about rolling over. Then quit acting like you're ready to lay down and die. What the fuck, Nate? Dude's been your partner for three games. He's had your back for two decades. It's not like a close friend like Elena's been kidnapped or something like no he's just like damn kid this treasure is this is already pretty nuts i'm not good I'm, I'm having some pause like you put yourself in the serious crosshairs of a very powerful organization and you're gonna be such a dick hey, where's where's my where's my fucking bonking hammer bad but because he's silly you know the silver fox man he goes along with you anyway because of course he does because he's silly because he's a badass now you go to syria to meet chloe and cutter who are unfortunately not responding to their phones at the moment and it is assumed that possibly talbot may have followed them as well which when we find them the reasoning is that uh, charlie only uses prepaid phones and is out of minutes and chloe broke hers we've been trying to reach you for over 24 hours oh right i need to top up my minutes you're using a prepaid phone? 
Mate, those contracts are a complete ripoff. <laughs> what? Mine's broken. Again? What a cop-out answer. What the hell? It's just, it's kind of insulting. That's the reason. Like, you could have had any other reason. Talbot's men are already there in Syria. You could have just had them say, yo, Talbot's men are here in Syria. Come over. The only saving grace here is that we get more time with Charlie Cutter, my beloved. You get through a bit of combat. Actually, quite a bit of combat, actually. There's quite a lot of combat at this part. I want you to look right here. Okay, right, right. See this corner? You see it, right? You know, there's a corner right there. What a pretty corner. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, just... Ooh, got those curves around there. A little bit of rubble. You know, it's fine, but mm, not a door, not a ladder. Nothing there. It's just... What a... No entrance, no exit. It's a corner. What a nice corner that happens to be. Crazy, right? Fantastic. Give it to me. Good. Now the journal. Thank you. Don't trust Drake. Shit. He's gone. How in the world? So I know I've been alluding to something being up with Talbot a little bit, but this is the part in the game that really turns your uh, sus meter to max. This man has a hallucinogenic mind control dart and arrived out of nowhere and disappeared out of nowhere. And the game even calls attention to it. He's gone. How in the world? And Charlie, Charlie, my <sighs> beloved, not doing great. No one's touching you, Charlie. What the hell was in that dart? Your face is peeling off. This next part is both great and terrible. Charlie's claustrophobia is at full stop here because he's tripping fucking balls. I don't know how many of you have ever had a panic attack. I've had a panic attack before. Uh, it's, it's not fun. Don't try it. There are a couple different ways people express their panic attacks. And uh, this is a pretty accurate one. It's just good. It's just good. It's just good. It's good. It's good. It's closing. It's closing. It's just Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't breathe. I just, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I've got to get out. I've got to get out, I've got to get out, I've got to get out. Shit, I've got to get out. Calm down, all right? That's really good. Charlie Cutter, once again, a great addition. But unfortunately now he's killing Nathan. This part kind of sucks. You just keep on punching each other for a whole while. And then Charlie just starts choking the hell out of Nathan. And, and, and Sully, in, in the man that he is, is just like, well, shit. Gonna kill you, but it's good. Charlie recovers. They have a little talk about it. All, all's fine. You know, he stops tripping balls. Eh, the whole thing is over. Uh, Sully, at least he's honest. Hold on this. You weren't. <laughs> you weren't gonna shoot me, were you, mate? Like a rabid dog. They do a little puzzle with globe on a map type thing. You get the other part of the amulet, and for some fucking reason, Charlie Cutter decides that he should be the one to hold on to the amulet because Nathan got it lost in France by Talbot. Why the flying fuck should Charlie Cutter, who nearly just strangled Nathan to death, why should he ever be holding on to this fucking amulet? And I know why. Because Charlie has to lose the amulet. Because Talbot needs to take the amulet. Because of course that's what happens. Because immediately afterwards, you run into the man, Talbot. There he is. Four on four. We seem to be evenly matched, says Talbot. Mm, yeah, I think you might have the upper hand. You got assault weapons, you know. Those things fire pretty fast, in fact. Really fast. But it doesn't matter because Charlie is, uh, well, you know. He ain't doing hot. But, Charlie Cutter, my beloved, that's the unthinkable. Now drop your guns. Don't you go cut and shoot him. No. Wait. Just stop. Okay? Now that's better, isn't it? Shoot him. You son of a bitch. Cutter, pull the trigger. My pleasure. <laughs> He makes a genuinely interesting twist. 
I didn't expect that. He just faked it. Nice. Charlie Cutter, best boy of Uncharted until... What the hell? You didn't get very far, did you? He's fine. He took a bullet to the chest and or upper shoulder area. He's fine. There's not even a bullet hole in his suit. He is spotless. He's gone from sus to imposter. The game wasn't already alluding to some shit up with Talbot before. Oh, they're doing it now. Medallion gets taken. Charlie has to jump off a roof in order to save himself. He breaks his leg. Then you carry him all the way out to safety. But once again, the game does call attention to Talbot's survival in, a, in one of my favorite lines from Charlie. How is that possible? I shot him right in that disgusting Nancy boy, <laughs> anyway, this is just a bunch of combat after this. You get to the tour bus from the area and you escape from there. And this is the worst part of the game. The worst part of all of Uncharted 3. The last time you see Charlie Cutter, my beloved. Chloe and him bow out. Chloe just doesn't think this is worth it. Charlie has a broken leg. He's got a bail anyway. Makes sense. And there's a theme going with this Uncharted game. The theme is that Nathan's obsession for treasure is gonna put both him and the people he cares about in the crosshairs of bad people and get them hurt. Been alluded already a little bit with Sully earlier, but then Chloe is also kind of saying this thing where he's, he's wondering the, why, why keep going with this thing? Like, what's the point? This this society is is nuts. They're so strong. Molly and Thomas Mayer are so strong and, and just, like, why is this this important? And you get a little bit of that feeling, especially since Sully is sticking with Nate. And the scene right after this, you go to Yemen and there's Elena. You know, she's doing some kind of journalistic something or another. You find out the two of them were actually married for a bit. Ballsy move there on the Naughty Dog, but hey, that's what it was. They have some discussion about it. You can tell that they're still kind of friends and all that, but it's got a little bit of tension there that you're not fully, fully sure how to deal with. But she brings it up. Keeps asking like, why this obsession with this hunting? It's alluding that old man Sully might be biting the bullet from something like this. Nathan keep going and going and going with this treasure hunting thing. Might get Sully hurt or even kill. No, I mean, why this obsession? I'm I'm just worried. I can take care of myself, all right? I'm not talking about you. <laughs> what, Sully? He would go to the ends of the earth for you, Nate. Just don't ask him to. But regardless, the three of them go through Yemen. There's some discussion here and there. It's called puzzles that are ranged from pretty good to kind of whatever. The three whole map thing was kind of whatever. The gear one was enjoyable. You had to match a whole bunch of gears in certain directions, spinning in certain ways in order to move this mechanism. And the last one was also really fun. You have to, it's like a giant room full of just body parts and you have to move a big light so it shines the perfect shadow in order to have a guy impale and that moves the water and all this kind of stuff. Again, all the puzzles are, are more mechanical. And I think it's a much, much better way to go about it. This leads to a celestial map that... Oh boy. Um, Nathan, in his infinite wisdom, decides not to write it down. He asks Sully, aging man Sully, to remember it. Because he's worried that Talbot will get his journal and be able to, you know, see the things he wrote down. So he asked Sully to remember it. Bro, I walk into a room and forget why I went into that room. Jesus Christ, you write down everything, Nathan, in your journal. Everything. Write down the fucking map. Even the spiders are telling you to write down the goddamn map because they're coming out of the walls. The walls that look like people and hands that are like molded into the walls. Pretty horrifying looking, and the spiders are there to, to keep it horrifying. Sir Francis Drake seemed particularly keen on making sure that nobody ever found the Atlantis of the Sands. In fact, right here is the final stop of his journey. This is when he gave up and turned back. It is written in grave detail across all of the different panels in this room that the Atlantis of the Sands is a pipe dream and it should not be sought out as it is cursed. And Elena is the smart one here. Okay, so, so let me get this straight. Drake sails thousands of miles looking for this Atlantis of the Sands. And when he gets this far, what he finds here is enough to make him turn around, 
sail home, and hide all evidence of his voyage. Right. But you, you're gonna keep going, aren't you? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna beat you in your goddamn dumbass Nathan Drake noggin. I'm gonna keep beating you. And the only thing that's gonna stop me is. No. Now it's your turn to trip balls. This sequence is probably a lot better in theory. You're really just running through the market while Talbot whispers in your ear and everything looks all wavy and stuff. And it goes on for two whole minutes, which might not seem like that long, but you know, I used to play League of Legends. Morgana stunned with three seconds and everyone was basically dead by old age by that time that thing wore off. So, you know, two minutes, it's pretty long. What's actually happening is you're being interrogated by Marlo and Talbot. You've told them everything literally everything during this period of time. And you told them that Sully happens to know where the star chart is because he memorizes it because of course that's what they had to do because they had to get Sully and put Sully in danger. I hate plot things like this, but what? It's fine. Marl does the usual, I know everything about you villain kind of thing, even alluding to the idea that Drake might not actually be his last name. And Nathan loses a game of chess, naturally flips the table and chases down Talbot through the streets. It's a visually fun chase. I guess it's kind of funny. There's nothing particularly exciting about it. You get a little bit of combat near the end and then you get hit in the face by a giant piece of wood and immediately transition to being held captive. Which again, Uncharted, your transitions are, they're a little, they're a little fast. You gotta let it marinate. So so we're pretty far into this video, but we're only about halfway to 60% through the game. That's because a lot of the meat and potatoes and character stuff all happens in the first half of Uncharted 3. The second half is a lot lighter on that, and in my opinion, to its detriment. This is mainly because it's the major sin that every Uncharted game commits. When Nathan is alone, the game is less interesting. And for a long while, Nathan's going to be alone as he's here with some friendly pirates. Look. You can torture me all you want. Okay. It was at this moment that Nathan knew he fucked up. After an extended punching section, again, with the terrible melee combat, you realize that you are actually in a ship graveyard. And it's a really good looking area. Visually, it's phenomenal. The climbing here is intense and exciting. The combat here is interesting. You can dive underwater and use the water as a way to go around enemies with a bunch of various floating platforms kind of just buoying a bit in the water. It's, it's really impressive looking visually and it's fun from a gameplay perspective too. Great combat arena. Some of the best combat arenas in the games. But the problem is that Uncharted's combat is sure it's a bit above average, but a six out of 10 is still above average. The game's combat is never anything particularly outstanding and it's held up by its spectacle and its story and characters. But here it feels like a side mission. It feels like filler. You just happen to be taken to this pirate area and they say that they have Sully. And so your mission is to go rescue Sully because he's the only one who knows about the chart. And you know, he's also your friend and all that kind of stuff, but still. So for the next good period of time you get nothing but combat and above average combat is above average but it's not enough to sell me on this part of the game in fact i was actually doing a little bit of research on this game because i know that uncharted 3 was kind of the one that everyone's a little bit iffy on and it seems that they split their team up when uncharted 3 was in development one for that game and one for the last of us and last of us in my opinion is better than all the uncharted games because it's just, i just think that game is nearly a masterpiece but uncharted 3 apparently struggled a bit during development because of that. I heard a rumor, and this is just a rumor, I'm not quite sure if it's true or not, I can't confirm it myself, that the game's gameplay segments and visuals and areas were done prior to it having a story, which is a rumor that I kind of would believe because it feels like you're going to a lot of these various interesting, sure, but various locales, and they need a reason for you to go there. The Syrian Museum, oh, they didn't charge their phones. This crazy pirate ship graveyard, oh, they took Sully and he remembered the map. And it continues from there. Again, I was impressed by this area, both gameplay and visually, but it feels like filler. Especially when you realize that they never had Sully, which, you know, it makes sense. I lied. I'm a pirate. Nathan shoots Mr. Pirate, blows a giant hole in the bottom deck of the ship, and the entire thing begins to sink because tiny little things like that just sink everything. I don't know if a fragmentation grenade like that would blow a hole so big into the ship where the entire fucking thing begins to sink, but hey, Napwis. Napwis. 
This whole next section is pretty great. It's a sideways ship. You're climbing on stuff. You get this great visual of the huge wall of water as you're hanging off a chandelier. That's crazy looking. The hell, Habibi. Nathan runs away, gets thrown into the ocean, and then miraculously winds up on shore. That just happens to be right where Elena is as well, or at least the city she's in. I, 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 Na Napwis. I have to call Napwis on this one. Napwis. They have some conversation. He crashes on the couch. They're both... You could tell a little tension between the two of them. They don't go too far into it. You have to go catch a giant plane that is apparently giving a supply drop to Marlo. Elena helps you do that. So you make your way out of the plane just barely via the landing gear. And that's actually the last bit of Elena we get in this game. I think that may be one of the reasons why I'm not as big on Uncharted 3 is also because it has the least Elena Fisher. Her and Nate together is, is just, it's mac and cheese, man. It's peanut butter and jelly. And even when their conversations are happening on screen, they're not as good as they were in 2, 1, and especially not 4. Because they're tense, you know? They have a weird thing going on, so they're acting a little bit weird and awkward. But still, it's just doesn't have that same charm. As you make your way through the plane, a guard just miraculously seems to find you underneath the panels, grabs you, and thinks that the best idea, instead of shooting you with the gun that you have in your hands, is to open the plane and throw you out of it. This... This guard is very dumb. And so, with the flap down, the two of you punch each other in that horrible... Horrible melee combat again. And there's a little bit of shooting as the cargo is moving around and shifting a bit. And then all oh, hell just gets loose. This is the scene most people know Uncharted 3 for. This is like the scene. And it's it's so pretty looking. Like it's just, it's such a spectacle. It probably is the best one in the entire series, even in four. Visually, it is just phenomenal. It's terrifying. It's exciting. I mean, you know what? I'll let it speak for itself. section is a bit more divisive. You basically wander around the desert in control of Nathan for part of it, cutscene for the other part of it, but there's no objective or goal. You just wander around the desert. And at the time, I actually remember not liking this part because I thought it was boring because I'm just moving my stick around doing nothing. But now, I think I've grown to like it. It makes you feel genuinely hopeless. This is the Rubal Kali Desert and you are in the middle of it. Hell, the, mu oh, the music here too is really good. And it just keeps getting worse and worse. You wander and wander in the day and the night. You start seeing mirages. You begin hallucinating. They even have some voiceover with Marlo that I think is actually, a. I, I really like it. I really, really like it. It feels like a finality. Come in under the shadow of this red rock and I will show you something different. From either your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. I genuinely enjoy this part. The gameplay is, is boring, but that's the point. The gameplay is supposed to feel hopeless and like there's nothing you can do because it's hopeless and there's nothing you can do. What ruins this thing for me though, is that Nathan stumbles upon like a ghost town village or whatever, finds some water, starts throwing it into his face and proclaims, it's undrinkable. What the fuck? 
fuck do you mean undrinkable? No, you're splashing it into your face. It looks pretty blue and, and clear. Like, what is it, the sand? Is it too sandy for you, Nathan? You little baby back bitch princess? Is it too sandy for you? Bro, it's been multiple days. I will drink battery acid in your position. Isn't this not that pure? This is an Aquafina. You know, I was gonna nap with this too. I was gonna nap with it, you know, I was like, whatever. But like, I've already accepted the fact that you, Nathan, biologically can still be alive here. It's been many days without water and then you proclaim it's undrinkable. And then right after this, right after this, you blow out of there. There's a dude there drinking water and you are in full combat mode. Full combat mode, you are fist fighting goons. You you shouldn't be able to lift up a bag of quarters. Nathan, you are dehydrated and malnourished. You should be barely able to fucking move your legs. And, and even then, and even then, when you finish the combat encounter, there is no cutscene, there is no prompt for you to drink any fucking water. He doesn't drink any fucking water. He just killed a bunch of people. They have canteens! The guy was drinking it! Why doesn't he drink the water like stupid? You, you know, as far as story nitpicks go, this isn't like the biggest one, but it's it's just so it's so fucking dumb. It's so dumb. Just have him drink the water. Anyway, you do more combat while still malnourished and dehydrated, might I add you. And then you get rescued by some locals on horseback. This guy named Salim, he takes you to his camp. And then you, and then he gives you a spot of tea. That's what Nathan drinks. A spot of tea. A little spot of tea. A little, little spot of tea. Fucking hell. So this is the final stretch of the game now. Uh, the guy who saved you, Salim, tells you the story of the Atlantis of the Sands. Ubar, Aroma of the Pillars, etc., etc. That that there's an old king, King Solomon, and he commanded the power of the jinn. The jinn are demons, apparently born of smokeless fire. And eventually, he cast out these demons and imprisoned them in a big vessel of brass, deep, deep within the city. So Ubar became this, this place of horrible evil, tormented by the jinn spirits themselves. And that if Marlo and their group get there and release the jinn, everyone is all dead. Now, normally, you know, if it was just someone like me, I wouldn't believe this stuff, but Nathan and, you know, us as players have dealt with the supernatural twice now. There's a good reason to believe this might actually be the case. So after this is a major convoy combat scene, which is pretty fun. You can ride the horse and shoot while on the horse, jump from truck to truck and back to horse and back and forth. It's really good. It's just a better version of the Uncharted 2 one. You get Sully, you rescue him. All's good. He feels fine. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Sully, he's a baller who gives a shit. And then you go Go into this giant storm, do some more combat, and you just find it. You just find it. You and Salim get kind of split up, but you just, you find the entrance. There it is. It, it is that jarring, by the way. Like, like it's just, it's there. Like, bam, <laughs> there it is. And you have your big reveal. Ubar, the, the Atlantis of the Sands. Gorgeous, by the way. Gorgeous. I love the look of this city of just gold and brass. And they have this giant sandstorm spinning around it, which doesn't quite solve the same problem as Shambhala with the GPS signals and the looking down and all that kind of stuff. But whatever, you know, it's fine. I, I mean, it's not fine. Uh, Napwis. Napwis. The entire place is still running. The fountains are still going and there's still water flowing through it. And just so happens that as they arrive to Ubar, an eclipse occurs. It's a bit of an omen. And then... Well, that's a hell of a thing. What? No. No. Please. Sully. So Sully's dead. Because it just so happens that Marlo and Talbot are already there. And the tormented spirits of the Jinn are there to play. This next combat encounter, I remember this back as a kid on Crushing. It is fucking hard. All of the regular goons, after taking enough damage, burst with flames of their on their eyes and face like demonic spirits born of smokeless fire, as they say. And they teleport around the arena. They throw like fireballs at you that explode on impact. They are a tough 
enemy. Someone that can outflank you that fast in a cover shooter, they hurt and they are tanky as hell too. This whole next arena is massive with that. And then after killing a few of these guys, what do you know? There he is. <laughs> Smug Talbot already there. Bling! His little gas grenade there with this noxious gas. And then things start to go wobbly. Nathan starts tripping balls. Enemies are still burning. Smoke and fire craziness. He's watching his reflection move. And then you're back where you were as a kid. And then the spiders are there. And then you're a kid again in the area with the spiders and the music. The music's actually really, really good. This probably must say. Play the music. <laughs> And then you find Sully. What? Turns out the water in the area is tainted and that when Nathan took a drink of it, he actually gave himself this kind of hallucinogenic thing. There were no demons of smoke and fire. He was just tripping fucking balls and going mad. And when it finally wore off, there he is. And Sully gives him a good Ow. But if the water is tainted like that, could be because of the gin, but that's the reason why Marlo and Talbot are there. They they want the water. They want to control their enemies through fear. So now it's back into save the world mode because it's not about finding the city anymore like it was with Lazarevich. It's now stop the enemy from having this incredibly powerful thing at their disposal. Go through some combat in the lenses of the sands, lots of enemies and the like, and then you finally get to the actual part where they're raising up the gin in the vessel of brass there it is there's the vessel there it is the gin is supposed to be inside that the two of you try to flank them and it just so happens that just on time talbot is there to give sully the what for he's always there every time the two of you end up in the water and with literally like three little rocket shots from this tiny little underwater gun blow up the entire crane system and then start to crumble the entire entire goddamn city. They call attention to this a bit ago. Uh, here. I'm surprised the whole place hasn't come crashing down yet. But I mean, come on, three, like three little rocket shots. The entire goddamn city starts to crumble. In the second game, you burn down the tree of life. Nathan, you burn down the tree of life. Like that makes more sense. This one, it's pew, pew, pew. And then the whole place starts coming down. From here, it's a mad dash to get out of the place. You know, the gin is no longer a factor. They didn't get it up. All's good. You're running out. They got some combat stuff. You run into Talbo and Marlo, and then things start breaking, and Marlo is stuck in this big old thing at quicksand, and they have the usual, like, hey, uh, you can't just leave her to die. And then Sully's like, Harry Kent! What a badass. Nathan, you know, he's the hero. He's got to be a likable guy. He tries to save her. Doesn't quite do it. And she, like the Wicked Witch of the West, just... Aah! And Talbot is, uh... Well, he's none too pleased. No! This is all spectacle at this point. The place is coming down like crazy. You're running away more and more. And then you get your final boss fight against Talbot. Which is just a quick time event. It is just awful terrible melee combat that's been throughout the entire game just with more button prompts that, that that's actually it this is the worst boss fight of all the games worse than one because at least in the first one you can shoot guys and in the second one it's not good either but you still shoot and have an arena this is just triangle square triangle square triangle square circle you have your little scuffle you fall down and then nathan holding onto the ledge shoots talbot dead and then Talbot falls down, and then you and Sully run your way out of there. Sully has a, has a good point with the three goddamn bullets. Three goddamn bullets. <laughs> Calling attention to it doesn't absolve you of the weirdness that was those three rockets destroying an entire city, but whatever. Salim arrives, grabs you, you all leave, and, and that's that now. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit. Now, if you have not played Uncharted 3, probably wondering to yourself, Bricky, all this Talbot stuff, these Talbot memes, face, the everything, the, the weirdness about him, right? Like the game was was hyping, hyping up for, for a Talbot reveal. The, the way you can take that bullet, the way he's always in the right place, he's following you, his weird mind control dart, that kind of stuff, right? When I was playing Uncharted 3, I was like, okay, 
This is weird. This guy is weird. Maybe he is one of the escaped jinn, and he's trying to find a way to release his kin. Or, or he has, like, the sway of it, or he already knows about it. He's actually utilizing Marlo to get his own gain. He's like an ancestor of his, something like that, right? Talbot's superpower is bad writing. No! There is none of this. They don't tell you a thing. Nothing. Zero. How he followed you to France? He must have just followed you. How he took a bullet to the arm? We don't know. Why? I don't know. How you survive? I don't know. Oh, is there a bullet hole? I don't know. They don't tell you. It's never answered. There is no answer. There's nothing. How did he arrive from that little corner and then leave? The game called attention to it multiple times. The game has called attention to the weird shit Talbot's doing. And there is no explanation. Nothing. He's just a guy. Remember what Napwis means. Nitpicks are problems when I say so. I'm saying so. Uncharted 3 is a good game. I like it. It doesn't deserve the bad rap it gets, but it is an unfinished one and it feels unfinished. That ending cutscene fight with him, the, the punching one, is not very good. It feels bad. It feels unfinished. A lot of the areas, like that filler section with the boat, also feels that way. There are a lot of parts of Uncharted 3 that feel unfinished because half the team went to go work on The Last of Us. So I don't think that there is some kind of theory about Talbot. I just think they didn't write him properly. I just think they just forgot to write a reason for all these kinds of things, or they couldn't, or they didn't have the time, or who knows why. The point being is that there is no good end to his mystery. He is just a henchman. <sighs> I got out of my system. So late Nate and Elena meet up back in Yemen. Sully has a very good conversation with Nate. I think I'll play it, actually, like I did with Uncharted 2. Look, I, um... I had a lousy father, a lousy childhood. I hit 40, I figured I was never gonna have a son of my own. Hell, I never wanted one. What the hell do I know about raising a kid? <laughs> then you came barreling into my life. Look, you don't have to. No, listen, I do. I have made a lot of mistakes, kid. A lot. <laughs> and, uh, well, I am not a perfect man. You're not proposing, are you, Sully? I mean, I love you, uh, but... Stop. Just stop being a wise ass for one second. How long have you been carrying that around? Too long. Thought I'd lost it. Here's the thing, kid. We don't get to choose how we start in this life. Real greatness? It's what you do with the hand you dealt. Nate and Elena seem like they kind of make up just a little bit there. And they walk away to a new plane that Silly bought happily ever after kind of thing. And for a while, that was the end of Uncharted. The games came out two years after one another, 2007, 9, and 11. Uncharted 4 didn't come out to 2016. This was, for a good period of time, the end of the Uncharted uh, saga, series, whatever you want to call it. It's not as bad as I thought it was. The problem with Uncharted 3 is that it has so many very obvious fixes, very easy changes, very simple adjustments that would make it a better game. And the narrative just does this a lot in some weird ways. It's not as consistent, it's not as fluid, and it doesn't feel as good as two does. I'd still say it's definitely a pretty good game. The difference between one and three is astronomical. And I was wrong about it. I had it pegged to worse than, than I thought it was, but no, it, it's, it's decent. Uncharted 3 is still definitely worth the time. It's worth the time. And it makes me excited because Uncharted 4 is next and I am so hyped talk about that one. Thank you everyone for watching this video. It was a doozy. It was a long one. I am literally about to pack up this office in an hour in order to move all this stuff out. So uh, thank you so much again for all your generosity and the kindness, all my patrons, members, YouTube, all kind of stuff. You're all great and wonderful. Thank you. I'll do some quick questions before I got to go because I got to pack. What is your favorite snack on a hot summer day? Ooh, big old slices of watermelon. A little bit of salt on them. Mm. Most exciting announcement from E3 2022. The Callisto Protocol, or whatever it's called, looks really good, but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to play it because I'm a scared little bastard, but it looks really good. Also, Hollow Knight, Silk Song, new trailer, still no release date. What song do you listen to that instantly cheers you up during rough times? I don't know exactly which song I would pick, but you know that song in the beginning of Payday 2? The um, Break the Rules song, that like 80s synth one? That's a good one. All right, everyone, I'm gonna move. 
And then I'll be back. And when I'm back, Uncharted 4, my favorite of the series. And honestly, the reason I started replaying the Uncharted games to begin with, so I could talk about this one. I'm hyped. It's gonna be a long video. Come on. Obviously, you're a skater.